though. This is never going back together. <laughs> the most complicated AIO I've ever taken apart. This thing is completely absurd with how it's assembled. This bizarre liquid cooler has a dual pump design that visually appears to be inspired by the Red Alert Aftermath Chrono Tank or Chronosphere. But even more important than that, its manufacturer, Alzai, says it has gravity coaxial with ultra long life. If you're wondering what that means, moving on. This is the Alzai Infinite i360, but sometimes it's called the Infinity. The product page and the product box don't match. It's always a good start when the company can't keep its own naming straight, but it wouldn't be the first time. The AMD 4800U is on the left. The Intel 11th gen platform is on the right. The cooler uses a unique dual pump design, meaning it has two pumps in the housing for a push-pull setup. The theory here is that that should speed up the liquid flow, which does actually help. We've tested that and demonstrated it before that as liquid moves through the micro fins in a cold plate faster, it does in fact help keep things cooler. It just depends on the heat load and it depends on the design. Something like an AIO, we might not see a benefit, but we'll test it today. And in addition to the review and the benchmarks, we will be tearing this cooler down to see what it looks like inside and just to confirm some of the statements that Alzai is making. Now this is $120 for the 240 millimeter version, which isn't far off of most of the other liquid cooler prices. The 360 meanwhile has been anywhere from 130 to 160 when we could find it. And much like the naming, the pricing appears to be inconsistent on this. But the cooler isn't necessarily just a meme product, despite how easy they make it. It might have some actual potential. So let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Fantex and the G300A Mesh Edition case. The Fantex G300A revives the A-series approach to airflow that Fantex began really pushing with the P400A that we liked previously. The new G300A comes in a few variants based on fan count and uses the Fantex ultra-fine front mesh that allows for a higher airflow without double stacking filters, as we've shown in the past. The G300A Eclipse is a compact tower supporting ATX boards, and you can learn more at the link in the description below. Alzai has been around for over a decade now. They mostly came up on LED lighting products products, but they've been doing cooling for a while as well. And the Infinite or the Infinity i360 has a set of modernized features. So it does the interlocking fans thing that you've seen pretty much everyone moving towards now where there's a pin to pad array as the uh, interconnect basically in between the fans. You socket them together and then you've got a cable that seats onto the end and provides power. So it's ticking the boxes that companies like Lee and Lee have been starting to, well, develop, to be ticked. We had to do most of the research on this one on our own because the product marketing isn't particularly helpful, but it does make some bold claims, such as, be cool, be visible, and new arrive just for better. It also talks about being more delicate, and it boasts of its dual sucker cooling liquid with intelligent factors. There are far too many options for commentary on dual sucker technology, so we're going to move forward with some technical specs instead. The tubing on this uses a PTFE interlined tubing. So it's basically a Teflon coating inside of a plastic tube. And there are typically two types of tubes for liquid coolers. There's a rubberized one, and those are kind of more common at this point. Then there's the Cooler Master style, which is basically what this is, where it's that more rigid tubing with the inner lining. Now, the benefit to doing the Teflon coating or the PTFE coating inside is that you reduce the permeation of the liquid into the tubes. Over time, there's some small amount of liquid loss as the liquid permeates those rubber tubes for the other types of liquid coolers. And that means a little bit of a reduction in the liquid volume within the cooler. The upside to the rubberized tubes is that they are more flexible. Whereas these types of tubes, if you bend them too much to a point of basically kinking it, it will crack that lining and then you have a more significant loss of performance and potentially of liquid. But the benefit is there and it's not something that's unique to Alzai. It's been around a while now. We also noticed that Alzai is using shorter tubing at 15 inches or about 380 millimeters, depending on where you measure, compared to the other coolers of its class. And that'll limit routing choices with large cases. While we're on the topic of sizing, Alzai seems to almost brag about its 20 millimeter radiator size as a point of pride. 20 millimeters isn't an abnormal size, and in fact, many mainstream AAA radiators now are even thicker than this. Now it also comes with a screen, and it's pretty simple. There's no GIF playback or fully enabled video playback like we saw with Height or Corsair recently. Instead, it's just a simple readout of CPU temperature. 
It can also show GPU temperature, the clock speeds of the CPU and the GPU, and the RPM of the fans. And that's it. You can enable or disable each of these independently in all Zeiss software. We used it and it was fine. It's nothing special. It had one bug where the feature to display only one parameter didn't work. It just constantly rotate system stats instead, but the software doesn't try to do too much and that's good. The screen in our unit also wasn't square, so it looks like it got shaken around or it just wasn't mounted properly. Alze may be a less known brand, but it's still putting some real effort into the finish. The packaging was good and efficient. Everything is neatly secured and there's minimal plastic waste, including resealable bags for the mounting hardware. The fans have metal branding embedded within the plastic. They aren't themselves metal, but it still makes for part of that better look. That wasn't the only weird thing we noticed about the fans though, with the gimmicky thick sticker that tries to make it appear like an exposed metal uh, bearing and hub. But the other thing, was the nine strut design. So the back of the fan has nine of these support structures. Typically you'll see four of them on the average fan. And it also is a nine blade fan. This is probably going to cause some problems for acoustics. And we'll show you that today because you're going to get some excess noise, especially at lower speeds as the blades pass over those support structures, those struts. Now it's time to tear this thing down. So we only do this for liquid coolers that are truly unique. And this one definitely is. We want to see the two pumps. There's one located on this side, one on this side. You can see where it's probably mounted here. And then on the bottom, it looks like all of our screws are in this cold plate where we've got them around the outer edge. For the teardown, I'm going to start with removing these screws around the cold plate. That will immediately cause it to leak the liquid that's in there, which is just going to be a propylene glycol. They have a sticker here that says warranty seal torn void. I don't know if we're actually going to tear in that spot. We'll see. The shape of the pump block probably has actual function because with there being two pumps in here, uh, they're going to need a little bit more of a, a strange design to reorient things to make sure it does in fact push and pull. So we'll see how that uh, shape justifies itself as we get into this. These are Torx 9. I am currently working over our silicone soldering and project mat. These are highly heat resistant. And of course, they can withstand uh, liquid cooling. Liquid, no problem, too. Makes it easier to clean up when we're done. And you can grab one on store.gamersnexus.net for your projects or for your more uh, advanced soldering needs. Jesus. <laughs> the screw, I don't know if that was caught on camera. I tried to pop it off the end of the driver and I hit it at the wrong angle and it flew about 10 feet. So let's pull the cold plate off. There's a large micro finned area, so that's good. That's what's getting them probably a lot of their performance. As for the height, I'd have to break out one of the Arctic ones or something to measure the height of the individual fins. Maybe we can take a macro shot of this or something, but Fin stack is, is nothing abnormal on this unit from Alzai, uh, or the micro fins, I should say. I'm going to drain this. I can hear a little more in there, but we got enough, and the solder mat will keep it off the table anyway. I'm trying to orient all of this in a way that it can go back together. All right. So let's check this out. That's just dry. I'm, I'm hoping that's not any kind of, it doesn't seem like any kind of gunk. I think that's just discoloration of the rubber from when they filled it and some of it dried and got under there because that side was in fact dry. It was pressed right up against the plastic. There's another Torx underneath this plastic. I need to figure out how to get this off. So there's enough clearance now I can get to this Torx 9 under here. So we might be able to take it all out, a little out of order. Probably this one's gonna live in a bucket <laughs> for the rest of its life because we have cracked plastic now in one spot. All right, so that is actually supposed to come out that way. Yep, and there's a fill port in there. So the warranty void sticker is where the fill port is. Great, that's good, good user service. I'm just gonna crack this thing. All right, let's see how this is built. That's the LCD. So on the other side of that is the screen. We've got USB power, so that's USB 2 power uh, and 
data, I guess, to that screen. So that's the inside. Not a lot going on on that side. On this side, there is actually a lot going on. So they have multiple custom PCBs here. This is kind of wild to look at. So check this out. They have this upper PCB that intersects with the outer circular ring. They have that on both sides. It's a half circle. So this is one half circle of PCB. This is the other half of it. I thought it was a punch through it, but it's not. So that's two PCBs plus the center one, plus the other side has two PCBs. So they're up to five PCBs just for this piece. And then the pumps are gonna be inside of here. That's the housing. So we're gonna look at that to see how big the impellers are and what kind of quality they look like. This looks like LEDs. So that's a strip of LEDs there. That's what shines through a little bit on the housing. So that one single LED light strip in there. Okay, that unsockets. It's glued, there it goes, right? There's hot glue holding that in place. Oh, there's all the copper coil in there. So I'm gonna have to cut that in order to see the, get to the impellers. See that copper coming out, that's attaching to effectively an electromagnet for the motor. I'm gonna clip that. It's really what we're looking for here is do they tell the truth about everything? And uh, also just how is the build quality? The impeller will tell us a lot about the longevity of the liquid cooler, uh, the AIO solution. So that's why it's important for us to occasionally sacrifice a unit to make sure that stuff people are buying is as advertised and is built to some kind of decent quality standard. So that, that's glued in place also. I see hot glue in there. So they've got glue in a lot of places for this. Once you get inside, there's glue all in there. It's also glued. This thing is a huge pain in the ass to take apart. They really made this complicated. Most liquid coolers, it's it's the screws on the bottom and then like four more. Okay, secret chamber to hide things. <laughs> oh, wait, another hidden chamber. Oh my God. <laughs> this is bizarrely complicated. I, I've never actually taken apart an AIO that has this many individual pieces. They normally mold it into fewer pieces of plastic. Oh, this is never going back together. <laughs> I can see the impeller. I just don't know how to get to it. Fucking. All right, one, one eternity later, I was just trying all kinds of stuff to expose the impellers, and there it is. I didn't know. <laughs> all I had to do was that. I pulled on it by accident. Interesting. There was one more hidden chamber and it was the chamber for our hearts. Oh my god, this is, this is the most complicated AIO I've ever taken apart. This thing is completely absurd with how it's assembled. I'm kind of shocked it doesn't cost like eight times more just for the manufacturing cost. So here's a carriage that these were sitting in, something like this, I don't know exactly anymore, but so there's the carriage. You've got part of the impeller structure um, and the motor here. And then you've got the impeller itself here. So this is one of the higher quality impellers and they did put two in there. So it is in fact dual pump. They're both the same pump. They seem to work. And a lot of gaskets, a lot of plastic, a little bit of glue and that's how they seal it all up. So these impellers I like, they're not as large as the ones you see in EK's adapted open loop components that they've brought over to AIOs. It's not quite as nice as those. These are more similar to Arctic's and better than the older Ace Tech three prong propeller or impeller rather that would typically uh, warp or die over time. Uh, so these are at least higher quality solutions than you see on some of those older Ace Tech models. So that's it for the teardown. This will not go back together. Let's move on to the next part. Our first chart is for a 200 watt heat load with the coolers fully unbound. We're running the fans at 100% speed and for the Alzai Infinity, that means it's louder, faster fans can try to brute force their way to the top of the chart. We'll look at testing with all the coolers at the same noise level next. 
As shown in this chart, the cooler ran at about 53 dBA under our standardized test conditions for all coolers. That's loud. It's up there with the Galahad AIO 360 and the EK AIO 360 as well. The results were 46 degrees Celsius over ambient, tied with the Galahad AIO 360 and within error of EK's Elite. Simply put, the Alzai Infinity is performing as expected for a 53 decibel liquid cooler with three 120 millimeter fans. It's about the same as the others. That means the remainder of the battle will be fought on the grounds of quality of life features, build quality, price, and looks, and to some extent, noise normalized thermals. The Liquid Freezer 2 420 was at 46.5 degrees here. While technically the same, or slightly warmer than the Infinity, its reduced noise levels at 45 dBA make it the more efficient cooler. The same goes for the Liquid Freezer 2 360 at 43 dBA, achieving most of the performance with a far quieter noise level. Remember that decibels are logarithmic, so these differences, seven decibels to 10 decibels are massive. But the Infinity did prove itself as capable. It's not just a meme product, it can actually perform. So let's go to noise normalized. We ran into an additional problem with our most controlled test for the Infinity, and it involved setting the fan speed. When we noise normalize, we set the same noise level for all coolers, but we continue using their included fans. The target is 35 dBA at 20 inch distance, and with the Infinity, we temporarily broke the fan response to PWM signal. This is a few problems rolled into one. Since the fans are louder than most at lower RPM settings, we had to drop PWM strength super low to get them to 35 dBA in our standard environment. In the process of doing this, at one point we must have fallen below the PWM signal strength required to keep the fans going, and we had two fans instantly ramped to full speed, and then we were unable to issue control to them anymore. That means even if we went to 90%, 80%, anything else reasonable, and the third fan was just spinning unpredictably and we could no longer accurately control it, but the motherboard still reported that they were spinning at 800 RPM. This isn't entirely surprising on its own, it's actually somewhat normal behavior because when you drop below the minimum required PWM signal strength to keep the fans operating properly, it's one of the possible outcomes. The difference this time was that we could no longer communicate with the fans. Eventually, we were able to fix it, we switched between DC and PWM a few times, we temporarily disconnected the fans from each other, and it all worked again. It's just that as an end user, your takeaway should be that this cooler is louder at moderate RPM settings than its competition, despite similar noise at the high end of the range. All that stated, we did get it to work properly for testing. So the Alzai cooler landed again between the Liquid Freezer lineup and the EKAO, but this time, the EK solution at the top is running six fans in push-pull. There's another EK AIO 360 with only three fans just below the Infinity. But the Liquid Freezer 2 420 is a fantastic academic representation of why we noise normalize. In the last test, it was technically warmer, but more efficient. But coolers get punished for that result when at 100% fan speed. In this test, it's at the top. The extra surface area and the capacity of the liquid really helps pull it to the top of the charts here. As for the Infinity, it does fine. It underperforms on VRM thermals, but for the CPU thermals, it's up here with everyone else once again. This chart shows how the cooler affects neighboring VRM thermals. For liquid coolers, we mount them in an equivalent position to a top mount in a case, so the fans blow straight into the VRM. As a result, of course VRM thermals remain more than good, but it's interesting that the Infinity runs warmer than other liquid coolers here. That's because the fan speed had to be dropped so low in order to hit the lower noise levels that it's lost most of its static pressure. So the Infinity would struggle at lower noise levels as you begin to add more resistance to the intake or the exhaust. It's important for you to keep in mind if you want it to be quiet. It's not going to do quite as well with the resistance as others. Pressure testing is up now. Every time we show one of these charts, we're showing you something that you all directly contributed to. This pressure scan testing is made possible with expensive software and tools that we purchased with help from all of our Patreon supporters over on patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Or, if you prefer to keep it all on YouTube, through our YouTube members and Super Thanks contributors. If you ever see a review that you find particularly helpful, consider sending us a one-time Super Thanks message in the comments below. We reply to as many of these as we can, or sign up on Patreon to help fund our continuing test efforts. Here are the scans. For the first 3950X scan, we noticed a gap in coverage along the top edge. That'd be towards the VRM, or the I.O. 
Otherwise, the pressure result indicates mostly good distribution of force across the rest of the CPU. It's just uneven and lacking on that edge. The second scan shows similar results for the 3950X with uneven distribution of pressure that seems to favor one side. We also scanned a 3800X just to give us a second CPU of the same type. Make sure it's not limited to one. This one showed the same pattern. There's lacking pressure on the I.O. side of the board. And that comes down to the mounting hardware, which is something that Mike will show off in a few minutes. Our final test is for flatness of the cooler, tested using an ultra-precise needle for depth and microns from a known zero point, which helps us evaluate if there are any gaping craters in the surface. The Alzai Infinity only had one pit that deviated meaningfully from the median, but overall its surface was smooth and flat. The cooler is alongside the same characteristics as the Assassin 4, showing an overall good finish to the cooler. The Amazon Basics and Spirit 120 coolers are good examples of where cost savings can affect cold plate consistency. So all's I did well here. Enough charts, time to talk installation and some of the mechanical design critiques with Mike. So the Alsi installation is actually pretty straightforward on both platforms. Uh, so we're gonna jump straight into it without much uh, explanation here. I'm gonna go ahead and remove my AM5 stock mounting brackets here. Alsai's mounting solution is very similar to the EK mounting solution. So I'm going to go ahead and install these standoffs that it comes with. And these are these are nice. They actually the kind of plastic washer support system here is pre-installed. These worked well and were stable, so to speak. Now on the pump side, the AMD brackets that you use that attach to the pump are held in by two screws each, respectively. I've already got that installed here from testing, so we're gonna go ahead and get some thermal paste down and, and mount the cooler. Something to know about this cooler, especially regarding the installation, is these tubes are very stiff. You can see I've kind of got this uh, radiator positioned behind me, and this is because uh, it just, it would, it, it would wanna be you know, sat up here otherwise, but I, I'm trying to make it so that we can both film it and not have these tubes be overly stressed during this demo process. But So I've got the cooler in place. Next, I'm going to place a single washer on each of these standoffs. And then next, I'm going to take the nuts that it comes with. They have a captive spring that's kind of an all-in-one solution right there. And I'm going to get each one of those started here on their respective standoffs. And these can be tightened until they bottom out and then they're nice, you know, they're nice and snug. All right, so that's it for the AM5 platform, but uh, let's take a look at the Intel platform because there's some assembly required with the back plate that it comes with. So also I has these standoffs that are keyed for this plastic retention, I guess you could call it a nut. There's no threading or anything on, a th on it. It's push fit and we'll get some B-roll of that. So that's the Intel bracket assembled. Let's go ahead and place it under the motherboard. All right. And now I'm gonna hold that while I install our LGA 1700 standoffs. Hmm. I was looking at the wrong place. Don't worry about that. A good thing to note is that <laughs> that's not going to happen, or those aren't going to come out once, obviously, once the standoffs are installed because they're going to retain those. And then we are, of course, going to have to swap out the brackets here that are attached to the pump. And with those installed, we would go ahead and apply our thermal paste next, and then the rest of the installation is the same as AM5. Now, once you have the cooler installed, there's three different cables coming out of this. You have a three-pin fan header, that's for your pump. We've got a USB header, which also has a, uh, 
a daisy chained male end so that you don't actually lose that uh, USB header completely to the cooler. This is required to make the LEDs work for the and the, the temperature readouts. And then you have an ARGB header. And everything else mechanically with the cooler worked fine. Um, the fans clicked together nice and easy. And then, of course, the, the fan cable attachment worked fine. I didn't have any issues. Um, Steve talks about the fans in, somewhere else in this video, so we won't cover them here. Um, but that wraps up the installation segment, and I'm going to throw it back to Steve. All I really nails some aspects of this, but the, it's, not a, it's not a clear win. We'd still buy something else. So at something like $120 for the 240 millimeter option, an Arctic liquid freezer 2240, especially without LEDs, will be far cheaper. And performance wise, you're at least on par, but definitely more efficient with something that isn't this Allzai cooler. It, it does fine for cooler. It's okay, but it's not impressive enough to buy if you don't really specifically like something about this. You'd have to like how it looks. That's basically the main reason you'd buy this. And if you do, great. It's not a bad cooler. But if you don't particularly care for it or it's not a compelling reason for you, then there are many other liquid coolers out there that are uh, at least as good, if not better for efficiency. And by efficiency, we're talking about the noise produced for the temperature result. So again, we come back to these fans where, you know, it's nice that they can socket together like we were showing, but the downside uh, of the fan design beyond the socketing aspect of it, which actually does work pretty well, that's that much is good, the way the cable connects is good, but beyond that, there are other aspects to consider, like the noise of the fan and how it cools at a given noise level. So we had issues at lower noise levels where because we had to bring the speed down so much to get those noise levels, and that's probably a result of this strut design on the back of the fans, uh, we end up with a, an issue with static pressure performance where it struggles to push past more than the radiator, for example. And that would become more of a problem if you're mounted, front mounted in some cases. As for the rest, they package it well. The company's actually trying here. It's not just some throwaway product. They really want to do a good job with it. And that's clear because of the money that's being spent on some of the finer touches for details on this. Again, like the interlocking fans, rubber damping on the back is standard, but not something you'd find on a throwaway product, and even the metal plating on the fan. So they're trying. It's just that in a competitive sense, they are at best about equal with their competitors, uh, and at worst, a little bit below for the noise normalized results. So that's it for the all eye. Infinity or Infinite i360. Pretty interesting product. We're glad we got to work on it. And uh, as always, thanks for watching. Check out our playlist for other cooler reviews. Or you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to support us directly by buying something like our mod mat that I'm working on here today or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.